All right, hello everyone. This is just going to be a very uh, brief kind of run through of what we talked about in lecture one and a bit more information so we can better go through module one. Um, we can, can talk a bit more about just biasing and you know what makes up an amplifier and buffer and a bit more of the nuanced details. Um, and hopefully that'll help you prepare for the module and also for future assignments. All right, so just to recap, um, we have our BJT, NPN BJT. We have our we have a base, emitter, and collector. So this is our base, collector, and this is our emitter. Okay, this operates in several regions, and these are all dependent on you know what voltages we apply. So we would like to operate our BJT in the forward active region, otherwise called saturation. And for this, we have to meet two restraints. First, the voltage from our base emitter has to be at least 0 0.6, 0 0.7, one forward voltage of a diode. Secondly, our collector emitter voltage has to be at least 0 0.2, 0 0.3, roughly. So over here, I have two curves. I have an IC curve versus VBE. And you know, let's just say we have a VBE on as 0 0.6. So what this refers to is just this on voltage here. OK. So over here, we can see that our current tends to be pretty small, uh, small up until we hit this VBE on point, at which point it very quickly skyrockets. So the first thing we notice is we need to have this voltage. We can get a large enough IC. Great. The second thing over here, this curve on the right, is IC versus VCE. OK, now remember that the whole idea of a transistor is we want to be able to modify our output based on only tweaking one variable. So what does manifest itself as in the BJT is we want to be able to tweak our IC while only modifying VBE. OK, so Keeping that in mind, if we look at this curve here on the right, it's versus IC versus VCE. And there's several, as you can see, several like steps here. We have VBE1, VBE2, VBE3. And the general idea here is that VBE3 is going to be greater than VBE2, and so forth. So VBE1 here, let's say, might be 0 0.2 volts. So that might be somewhere here, so small IC. As VBE increases, our IC is going to increase here, just following this relationship here. Okay. Now, what ha what's happening over here is that for very small values of VCE, if we focus on, let's say, this bottommost VBE curve here, very small values of VCE, we're going to be somewhere here. And that's a very tiny current. So our device may as well be off. Okay. And as we increase VBE, um, we can start moving to further curves. So what's going to happen now is let's say we select VBE, um, it's going to be the fourth curve here, so this is four, and this is going to be three. Let's say we look at VBE four, okay? Um, we're going, what's going to happen is we're going to, we're going to increase, and then eventually we're going to kind of flatten out a bit, okay? So this kind of happens way over here, okay? This happens, say, VCE sat for three, okay? Just referring to, sorry, four referring to that fourth VBE curve. So what this means is that for very small values of VCE, our collector voltage still has an effect on our collector current, which is not ideal. We only want the base emitter voltage to have an effect. So once we get past our VCE sat point, we can see that our IC starts to flatten out. In other words, it loses its dependence upon VCE. So the slope here would pretty much be zero, right? Another thing we notice is that as we increase VBE, we need a larger VCE before we go flat, okay? So that's what these red dots are. These red dots are where, for a certain VBE, where does our IC versus VCE curve collapse, such that we no longer have a dependence on the collector voltage. So we can see that this kind of, these red dots, which is where it goes flat, mimic this exponential curve here. And in fact, it's just the overlay of these two is where you find these uh, VCE sat points, okay? So, I guess in short, as VBE increases, so too does VCE sat. In reality, VCE sat is the point at which our IC versus VCE curve becomes linear. So this whole time we've been saying, hey, it's going to be flat. But we say it's going to be linear now. And from lecture, we talked about this. This has to do with the so-called early effect here. So just for one arbitrary VBE curve here, an arbitrary one, OK. There's so going to be some point at which we no longer, we go from this weird kind of exponential to now just being linear, OK? That's this point here. Call that VCE sat. And then after this point, it starts to increase with a slope of 1 over R0, where R0 is IC or VA. 
and VA we call the early voltage. And it's typically around 30 volts or so. Okay? So that's great. We've now covered some of the uh, the current responses of our transistor and our signal model. Okay? Now, just to recap again, if we have an IC versus VBE and we operate, say we operate over here, we bias our transistor with this VBE prime. Okay? So we're somewhere here. Okay? Let's define what we call the trans transconductance, GM, as the slope at this point. Okay, assuming VCE is constant as well, and it should also be VBE constant. Okay, now if we decide to find a slope, we can come up with an equation saying that the change in our current, a change in our IC, is going to be equal to this slope times the change of our input. I mean, this makes sense, right? If we, if we zoom in over here, if we want to have changes in our input over here, these manifest themselves as changes there. Okay, so kind of a a throwback to calculus, okay? So, great, that's our GM. This relates our change in uh, IC to our change in PPE, all right? So, next thing we talked about in lecture, we talked about this idea of a large signal model. So, I've gotten a few questions about this, and effectively, when we make a transistor, we don't know how it operates. What happens is we make the device, we run through testing, and we get different values of its output, and we try to extrapolate you know equations that relate these inputs to outputs from here it's a lot of curve fitting so now we try and find you know different elements that we know we know resistors capacitors diodes you know current sources voltage sources we try and model these kind of complicated input output relationships using elements we know so you know we make we make a bjt we kind of keep track of how does it you know ic change versus vbe etc cetera, etc cetera. and we find that it has an exponential model that kind of follows that of a diode. Hence why in a large signal model for, you know, a BJT, we have a diode between our base and emitter. That's a general idea. It's just how well can we use elements we already know to describe the behavior of a BJT. That's our large signal model. Okay, so we have this diode, and we know diodes are inherently nonlinear. They have an exponential curve, just like this one over here, this IC versus VBE curve. Alongside this, we also have a nonlinear um, voltage dependent current source here that has the same current that goes to this diode just multiplied by a factor of beta. Okay, so IS exponential VBE over VT and this current going through the diode is that just divided by beta, right? Which follows the same IB is, is, is equal to IC over beta, right? And VT is 26 millivolts. And we know VT is going to be equal to KT over Q, temperature in Kelvin, Boltzmann constant, and charge in Coulombs. So now the next step is let's try and, you know, linearize it. Let's say we only operate within small regions of this VBE this in this region here, right? In this region here, we see that we get a, you know, proportional IC response. It's no longer nonlinear. It's just multiplied by this GM, right? So what happens there is we can now kind of take our, you know, nonlinear source over here, okay? And we can now describe it over here, that we have a certain voltage drop from base to emitter, which we call V pi, okay? And that's going to be multiplied by GM to give you your collector current, right? That's your collector current, small signal collector current. So that's great, that kind of follows the equation we did above with transconductance. Next thing we have over here is we have this resistor, R pi, between our base and emitter. And the way this comes up is simply by just looking at this relationship here, where you know, we have IB is equal to IC over beta. So that means the change in IB, delta IB, is a change in IC over beta, which is this equation here. And now uh, we can solve the change in IB by plugging in this transconductance equation we got. And we'll get that change in IB is going to be GM over beta times delta VBE. Okay? And what we say is R pi is beta over GM. So this also saying is, hey, um, between our base and emitter, right, which is this, we're going to have a certain base current, and this is going to be inversely proportional to one of our, uh, to our pi, okay? So that's how the R pi comes out, and that's how we get beta over GM is R pi. So beta is around, you know, 100, 200, and GM is typically a pretty small number, um, you know, maybe 26 um, micro, um, millisiemens or so, so something like that, typically. So R pi is going to be pretty large, okay? And the next thing we talked about is, well, you know, how do we now make this into an amplifier? Our small signal model tells us 
you know, small signal parameters, but we need now we now need this notion of, you know, how do we use the Boolean amplifier, how do we get gain out of it? Okay. So from that we talked about, you know, the common emitter BGT amplifier, and we included this early effect from before. So first this little recap of what's kind of happening here. Okay, so this is VDD. We have an RC tied from our power supply to our collector, taking our output at our collector, our emitter is grounded, and our base we have tied it to V in and a DC bias of 0 0.7 volts. So what's happening here is a 0 0.7 takes care of you know making sure that we have you know at least 0 0.6. So that's great. We're always going to meet that requirement. So that checks off this VBE requirement. The second requirement is we're going to be VCE is going to be greater than 0 0.2 roughly. Okay, so we're going to talk about that after. But for now, focusing on the base, we have a 0 0.7 that meets it, which is great. And this VN, this VN curve is going to be purely AC. And what I mean by that is it's not going to be any DC bias. It's going to be a pure sine wave DC value of, whoops, DC value of 0. And get back, there you go. So DC bias of zero there, okay? So what this means is this AC wave, this VN, will ride on top of our 0 0.7 volt bias, okay? That's gonna be important for later. But, you know, from lecture, again, we went through the small signal model for this. We, um, I guess I can quickly go through it one more time over here on the side. So we have, um, yeah, that's actually a good thing I'll go over and explain this because we'll also talk about, you know, what happens for DC biases in our small signal model. Okay, so the small signal model is never going to change. It's always going to be this R pi, and we're always going to have our emitter, and we're going to have our voltage dependent current source. This is going to be GM pi with our collector, emitter, and our base. Okay, that's always constant. So from my diagram here, we see that our um, let's see.